What do we mean when we say move? It's from the Anglo-French mover, from the Latin. All right, I don't know how to pronounce Latin, so let's just skip to the definitions. Move, to change residence. You know, it's the one where you get free pizza if you help out. Move, to change the place of a piece in accordance with the rules of the game. Think chess, checkers, shoots and ladders, you get the picture. Move, an act of moving, a movement. Really feels like they didn't try with this one, so let's just skip it. Move, to set or keep in motion. Isaac Newton loves this one, but it's still not the definition I'm looking for, so let's try one more. Move, to take action. Now this one, this one I like, to take action. Let's talk about this one. Let's talk about being called to action, about being called to move. Get your Bibles open if you have them, please, to the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 4. We're in a series on the book of Acts. Acts is the source book for the spread of early Christianity. It documents all that Jesus continued to do to grow the church through his word and his spirit. And by the end of the book, the progress is remarkable. One church of 120 believers has turned into thousands of believers in dozens of churches all throughout the Mediterranean region. So the story of Acts is documenting that. It's an exciting one. It's an exciting story. It's, it, it, it invites us to participate in its daring adventure. Now, last week, we looked at the documentary of a church on the move. 3,000 people were added to the church in a single day. 3,000 in a single day. Uh, what, what kind of church sees that happen? Well, this church was committed to the gospel. They did not shy away from telling people about Jesus. If you measure Peter's sermon on Pentecost against the standards of the modern-day TED Talk, Peter's message is pretty boring, and it breaks all the modern-day oratorical rules. But Peter's message is the gospel, and the gospel is the only message said to contain the power of God. It has a mysterious and almost inexplicable knack for piercing the most emphatic objections. So this church was committed to making it known. They were also a church committed to caring for one another scrupulously. They loved each other like family. There was nobody in need among them. And they were a praying church. They expressed their dependency on the Lord through it. And the Lord sparked revival through this church. Now, in the section immediately preceding the one we're going to look at today, Peter and John were going about their mission, bearing witness to Christ, telling people about his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, when they ran afoul of the Jewish authorities. Take a look at it in verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. So get your head around that. Jailed for preaching the gospel. So after one night in the slammer, they're dragged before the who's who of the Jewish ruling council, the Supreme Court, in which they were told... No more talking about Jesus to the people. Well, look at how Peter and John respond. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now, throughout their interrogation, Peter and John exemplify the noble way of handling this sort of thing. They were polite they were honest, and they were clear. It's a harrowing experience. What would you have done next? If you had lived through that, what would you have done next? Well, let's look at what they did. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So after a tense and scary several hours, they went to be with their friends, their people, the church, other believers. There's a perfectly natural response to the ordeal they've suffered through. 
It's good to have Christian friends. They saw their church as a community of mutually supportive friends. One of the best and most natural responses we can have, you can have to a scary experience, is to recount your story to your friends. Let them in on it. And friends, be ready to listen. Close your mouth and just listen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, listening can be of greater service than speaking. It's a good and natural way for friendship within the church to operate. Verse 24, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. So after listening to Peter and John retell the story of their plight, the church then responded in a way that many of us would not have. They did not say, well, let's go find the best attorney to help us fight this injustice. Nor did they say, okay, new plan. That message didn't go over very well. We need to change it up. And they certainly didn't respond by saying, okay, where can we get some chariots and swords? They did not respond by complaining, by plotting, or stewing. They prayed. They were quick to pray. Throughout Acts, prayer seems to be a reflex to almost any circumstance these Christians encounter. Now remember something. This is a church through which God has already launched revival. A revival sparking church is a praying church. Peter and John shared their burden with their friends, and then they all prayed. And I hope it's your desire to see this reflex in our church. When you live through an alarming experience, or you're just living through a season where the muscles of your soul are constantly sore, bring it to your Christian friends and be quick to pray. May prayer be our reflex. What did they pray? Look at it. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, we know that Acts documents a church on the move, but there are ingredients that go into a church on the move, and prayer is one of them. Quick trivia question. Which New Testament book talks more about prayer than any other? Of course, it's Acts. This church on the move was a movement of prayer. And we're compelled to see the connection between the two. Let's make some observations about their prayer. Number one, they pray for boldness. They pray for boldness to continue preaching and teaching the gospel, even though they've been forbidden from doing so. Notice what they don't ask for. They do not ask the Lord to make things easier. They don't ask for the danger to be removed. They don't even ask for the authorities to all get converted, clearing the way for smooth sailing in their missional endeavors. They don't ask God to mitigate the risks. They ask for boldness to continue bearing witness to Christ no matter the environmental conditions surrounding them. The biggest enemy is not our circumstances or the wickedness of the world. That is not the biggest enemy. Our biggest enemy is our proneness to disobedience. Think about this. This church faced a dilemma. They had two options in front of them. They had one of two things they could avoid. The first thing they could avoid is trouble with the authorities. The other option is to avoid bearing witness to Jesus. Disobedience to Christ was and is our biggest enemy. They chose the route that, on the surface, put them in the greatest physical peril. They pray for boldness. Second, they focus on the sovereignty of God. 
Now, what do we mean by the sovereignty of God? Well, let's let the scriptures tell us. Psalm 115 says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. You want to know the sovereignty of God is? Anything God pleases to do, he does. That's the sovereignty of God. Anything he pleases to do, he does. Or Ephesians 1.11, the Lord works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. It doesn't say the Lord works out some things or most things. Everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God's will prevails all day, every day. Or Acts 17.26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. <laughs> God is the one who determines when nations rise and when they fall. God is the one who determines a nation's date of birth and date of death. God is the one who determines the GPS coordinates of their boundaries. That's the sovereignty of God. Psalm 105, 25. He turned their hearts to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. Context, it was God himself who turned the hearts of the Egyptians against his people to hate them and conspire against them. Yes, the world is not out of control. Even the evil you see is under the jurisdiction of this sovereign God. Robert Tanny Hill puts it this way. He says, in a time of threat, prayer can be a rediscovery of the sovereign God who wins by letting our opponents win and then transforming the expected result. This rediscovery can keep God's witnesses faithful in spite of threats. Of course, if you believe God is a tyrant, void of anything good, then you're going to despise his sovereignty. If, however, God is good, and then you want him, and you need him to be sovereign. I have found the best place, personally, to remind myself of the goodness of God is the cross of Christ. Jesus willingly, not under compulsion or begrudgingly, clothed himself in my sin and receive the just judgment of God against it in my place. And God did this not because his life was empty and unfulfilling without me. The tripersonal God has always been infinitely happy. He did this because that's the kind of God he is. How good, gracious, and loving must he be? If this is the measure of his goodness, then you want him and you need him to be sovereign. Now, fear is a natural human emotion in the presence of danger. But when we experience such fear, we should address it. Address your fear with belief in God's sovereignty. It's going to enable you to concentrate on obedience without compromising, choosing an easier path. So you see in their prayer, boldness isn't just something they ask for. The seeds of boldness are already present in the way they pray. They're already bold. When our belief in the sovereignty of God is on fumes, I'll be clear about this. When your belief in the sovereignty of God is on fumes, so will your courage be. When our belief in the sovereignty of God is inflamed, so will our courage be. Third, they pray with Bible-rooted Confidence. Now, when we begin praying, when I begin praying, maybe you're like me, oftentimes I'm very quick to jump to my list. Are you quick to jump to your list? Am I the only one that does that? I got my list, right? Just kind of heave it onto God's lap. I've got 15, 16, 173 things on there, right? Just heave it on his, li- on his lap. You notice how they pray? Does this... Revival sparking church begin with their requests. No. The prayer starts in verse 24. There's no request in verse 24. There's no request in verse 25. There's no request in verse 26. You see where this is going. 
There's no request in verse 27. There's no request in verse 28. It's not until the very end of the prayer they present their request to God. The bulk of the prayer is preoccupied with extolling the matchless character of God. In prayer, they are reminding themselves of who God is and what he's like. Do you see prayer that way? Not just as a way to to list off your litany of things you'd like God to clear up for you, but as a way to preach to yourself the matchless character of God. And they use scripture to do so. Notice the extended quotation of Psalm 2 in their prayer. When you're not sure how to pray or what to pray, I'll tell you the easiest thing to do is open your Bible. Open your Bible and let it tell you what to pray for. Now, Psalm 2 is what they use. Psalm 2 is, in context, is a royal psalm. It was probably composed for the coronation of a king. And in the psalm, in Psalm 2, God promises the king victory over his enemies who plot against him. In the original context, the opening two lines of Psalm 2 pose a rhetorical question that stresses that the attack of hostile nations is futile. Let me read it for you. Psalm 2, 1 through 6. Why do nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath. And terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So after facing this chilling opposition, the church, after facing this chilling opposition, (laughs) they include in their prayer of response, Psalm 2, in which it says, God laughs at threats. What does that say about the church's posture? What does it say about their posture? I know they're asking for boldness, but the boldness is already there. The title to to Psalm 2 might as well be, Our God is not scared. If our God is not scared, why should we be? God's not worried. He's not worried. Why should we be? See, the right kind of confidence is not incompatible with the Christian life. This church who's experienced a defeat is not cocky about themselves. They're confident. But their confidence is rooted thoroughly in the promises and truths of Scripture. God laughs at threats. This confidence was on display in a guy by the name of William Schaffler. He was a German missionary. He went to Constantinople to preach the gospel in the 1800s. And uh, he was warned, that was part of the Russian Empire, he was warned by the Russian ambassador. Ambassador came up to him and said, listen, my imperial master, the czar, will never allow Protestantism to set foot in Turkey. And Dr. Schaffler calmly answered him. He said, the kingdom of Christ, who is my master will never ask the emperor of Russia where it may set its foot. There is a kind of strength, fortitude, and confidence that is healthy because it's rooted in the truths of Scripture. God laughs at threats. It would not be ungodly of us to join him. Fourth, They use the past to shape expectations for the future. Verse 27, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, these verses are explaining why they can pray with Bible-rooted confidence. You you see what's happening? (laughs) They're essentially saying, listen, Okay, you're telling us to be quiet. You're jailing our people. We've seen this movie before. We've seen this movie before. The forces of evil in the form of Herod, Pontius Pilate, and their minions were arrayed against Jesus. 
Huh? We know how that worked out. Hmm? What looked like a defeat in the cross breeds an unexpected victory in the resurrection. Do you see what the church is doing? They're using the past to shape expectations for the future during what feels like a defeat. It's Saturday, but they know Sunday brings with it an empty tomb. Whatever the setback, whatever the disappointment, whatever the roadblock, Christian, come on. You've seen this movie before. You've seen it before. Some days it will feel like Saturday. In those moments, you need to preach to your feelings that Sunday is coming. Finally, they were filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Verse 31 tells us a special manifestation of the power and the presence of God was imminent. They were filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. And the result of this and purpose of it was to empower them to continue to speak the word of God with all boldness. Do we pray like we believe that happens when we pray? What if we are filled afresh with the presence and power of God when we pray? Wouldn't we be doing more of it? A revival sparking church is a praying church. You don't get to revival by going around prayer. A church on the move is a praying church. Eckhart Schnabel, who's a New Testament scholar at my, my seminary I attended, wrote this. He said, all too frequently, decisions in the church are based on the expertise of specialists who argue pragmatically in terms of what has worked for others or on prepackaged programs or plans that have been devised on the basis of sociological or marketing principles. Prayer is added because this is what Christians do. The vitality of churches in the global south who rely much more directly on God as they often have few modern resources raises serious questions for us. And he says this, there is an immense difference between what works and who works. The question whether we depend on ourselves or on God is a crucial question that must be faced and answered with truthfulness. The church in Acts is on the move. And there's enough in there to conclude they understood the difference between what works and who works. Do we understand this difference? There is an immense difference between what works and who works. The Australian Christian author and speaker John Dixon came to Christ through the faithful witness of an ordinary middle-aged mother by the name of Glenda. At that time in Australia, public schools used to offer a scripture class taught by a volunteer from a local church, and Glenda became John's teacher. Well, eventually, Glenda invited the whole class to her house on Friday afternoons for lunch in honest conversation about Jesus. Dixon writes this, so we went back the next Friday, and the next Friday, and the next Friday. Slowly but surely, the Jesus stuff became as important as the food. So we came with more and more friends. Some of these 15-year-olds were the worst sinners in the school. But Glenda just opened her heart every Friday afternoon and treated us all like we were family. There was one night when my friend Daniel was rather intoxicated, and we knew we couldn't take him to his house. His dad was an army man and would be livid with him. But we didn't want to just leave him on the street. So we all said... Let's take him to Glenda's house. She'll have him. She'll clean him up. So it was near midnight, and we knocked on her door. It turned out she was finishing some kind of posh dinner party with lots of guests, but she didn't bat an eye. 
She welcomed us in, showed us straight past her guests into the back of the house. She went and got some spare clothes and said, throw them in the shower, clean them up, and put them to bed. We'll sort it out in the morning. So we did. The next morning, we went back to Glenda's house around 10 to pick up Daniel. He was sitting at the kitchen table, and Glenda was making him bacon and eggs, and they were having a good old chat. We took Daniel to Glenda's house because she had left a real impression to us that Christians actually like sinners. We had no doubt she hated our drinking habits. She was a teetotaler and openly talked about avoiding alcohol. But even in that situation, her first instinct was not to condemn us, but to love us more, and it was extraordinary. After about six months of scripture classes, Friday afternoon events, and the incident with Daniel, we found ourselves thinking that Jesus was real, that he is inescapable, that he's powerful. So about six or eight months into it, about five of us became Christians. We really surrendered to Christ's lordship and accepted his mercy. Years later, John writes, I was starting my own ministry and trying to explore new modes of reaching people. So my first thought was, I'll go to Glenda and ask her what her secret was. Several of us had become Christians through her influence. I figured she must have had some strategy. I went to her fully expecting her to tell me about some program she implemented or some particular way she had of sharing the gospel. But without batting an eye, she said, prayer. I was really disappointed. (laughs) But she continued. That year, a bunch of us who taught scripture decided to make it a year of prayer just to plead the Lord of the harvest to do something special. And we did. By the end of the year, there you all were, confessing Jesus. For an activist like me, that was a poignant lesson. In the end, the harvest is God's. It's not mine. It's not my creativity. It's not my skill. It's God's. We just have to bring our ministry to God and cry out to him to give us success. Glenda understood there is an immense difference between what works and who works. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we are convicted over thinking that our strategic plan is the thing. That the program is the thing. That the crafty way in which we go about planning stuff is the thing that gets this work done. Lord, I pray that you'd remind us there is an immense difference between what works and who works. So Lord, I pray that that would change our approach, truly change our approach. That we would be a a church that is quick to pray, quick to acknowledge our utter dependence on you, quick to plead with you, to plead with you. The Lord of the harvest, to send a harvest among us, in our community, in our state, our nation, our world, there is an immense difference between what works and who works. Lord, I pray that that would change us down to the individual level. There are people in this room that are just going through a very difficult time and they're trying to figure out solutions on their own. Lord, show them there's an immense difference between what works and who works. Lord, humble us. Make us a people of prayer. Transform us into a church on the move because we are first and foremost a movement of prayer. We ask these things to the glory of Jesus' name. Amen.